Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a very cool new uh, feature in Gruff. Um, we call it the time machine. Um, and so I'm going to do a few little demos with it and then at the end explain how you can start working with it yourself. So, but before I go into the demos, um, I want to go back a little bit in time. So, I see that uh, in the list of people, there's a lot of people that have heard me talk before. Um, so, we at France have been uh, working at event-based applications for many, many years. Yeah? I've given talks about how almost everything we do can be couched back into events. And for us, an event is simply a thing that has a type, like a meeting, a communications event, a financial transaction. Uh, and recently, we've done a lot of uh, event-based processing in healthcare. Um, and for that, you need reasoning. So we provide that. Then uh, an event always, in our case, has a list of actors, sometimes only one, but many times more. Uh, we an event almost always has a, a place, so we need to use spatial reasoning. Um, and then events have a start time and an end time, and that's, of course, the most important thing for today. And then events have many other things that describe the event. So in order for us to work with events, we, in the past, already developed social network analytics, um, and we made sure that the four most important questions in uh, social network analytics can be answered with the Lego graph. We can help you how far is one entity from another one, to what group does a particular person belong, how important is this person in the group, and does this group have a, a leader or not. Yeah, so that is one thing that we've built in, even into our Sparkle. So you can call social network analytics directly in our Sparkle. The other thing we did is we developed uh, some geospatial capabilities in our product, and so we are very, very efficient that if you have a particular event that happens somewhere, we can ask for all the other events that happen within, say, five miles within a particular time period. So that is geospatial. And then we have been talking for many years about how we can provide temporal reasoning. Uh, we implemented Ellen's interval logic um, directly into the product. So if you want to do interval reasoning in Sparkle or in Prolog, you can do that. And it all comes together in, um, in our query languages, uh, we support the libraries that I just talked about in Prolog, and we provide it in Sparkle. If I have enough time today, I'll also show this in Sparkle. But here is, for example, a query that says, find all the meetings that happened in April within five miles of Berkeley that was attended by the most important person, Janssen's friends, friends of friends. Yeah. Um, so very powerful to use all these libraries in one query language. And again, for today, the important thing is that there's always a temporal uh, event. Then what I also did um, several times when we talked about what the difference is between property graphs and, and semantic graph databases, give several talks about how we model properties. And, um, and so we talked about various applications where time is important. Um, just to give you an example how we model, yeah, if, say, you have a network of, um, so this is a demo we wanted with PayPal, um, where we have accounts and payments between accounts, then you could say, well, there's a direct relationship to this, between this account that paid this particular person here, but then you lose a lot of information. So we have always this intermediate object, in this case, a transaction object, where we can say, it was a, a transaction of $111. It happened at this particular date here in a town called McFarland. And so you can see how, by using these interactions that have a temporal component, we can model temporal relationships. Same thing applies, say, for uh, corporate ownership, So, and especially when we talk about role objects. So here's a database with, the ent with legal entities, including both human entities and companies. And for example, here you see that there's a person that was an executive for a number of companies here. So this, the, the blue ones are foundations. So here you see that this person was an executive from 01, 08, 2012 to 01, 10, 2013. 
Um, and then you see that these companies here that he controls actually are full stock owners from a begin time to an end time for another company where these companies then again are full stock owners of other companies and this goes on for really quite a while. Yeah. So this is the way that we model very often temporal relationships, roll objects, um, and, and events. But one request that we got over many years, over and over again, is that, okay, so it's wonderful that you can do all these geospatial, temporal, social network analytics things in your query languages, but one reason why I use Legograph is that I do almost all my work in Graph, and I can't see how my graphs are built up over time. So can you make something? And so, um, <clears throat> well, we, we, we hesitated a while because there's so many ways that people can model temporal relationships. But finally, we decided that, that we've seen this pattern enough, you know, where you have this interaction object with time, that we just will center our time machine in graph just around that pattern. And so here we, here's some demos. Uh, one, is the, one of the demos is about Crunchbase. So Crunchbase released a database in 2014 with all the, the acquisitions and, uh, and investment rounds for several years. And we turned that into a, an electrograph demo. And then we have a police application that I want to talk about. But let's start with Crunchbase. So let me start Graph. I'm assuming that everyone in the audience already knows Graph. I looked at the names. So I, I think you are. So here we have Graph 7.1.0, downloadable right now from our website. And um, okay, let me let me find some companies. So, for example, I want to know about uh, MongoDB. So I type in MongoDB star, and here we have MongoDB. And let's see for MongoDB all the investors. Yeah. So here, again, I'm assuming that you guys already mostly know how Graph works. Yeah. Here we see all the subject predicates. Here we see all the object predicates. And so let's look at the investees, yeah, the people that invested. Sorry, where MongoDB was the investee of a venture round. So now I have a number of ventures, venture rounds that, uh, that invested in MongoDB. Let me select them and select this one and let me select the predicate investor. Yeah, let's look at this. And so here what we see is some investments in MongoDB. Yeah. Um, so we see that Sequoia Capital. So let, let me re let me read one for you. So actually, this is already a good point to do the demo of the time feature. Yeah, so what you see here is MongoDB, several investment rounds, and then companies working together in investments. So how would it look like if I, um, if I turned that time machine on? So here I do this. I hit the letter Shift A. Uh, how do I, st oh yeah, if I go to View, I can actually go to the time bar. Sorry, I'm one of these horrible people that does everything with keys. So it's Shift A. Somewhere is a <laughs> is a menu item to do this. Okay, so now what you see here is what we call the time bar. Yeah, I can go with my mouse and I see that there's a venture in 2008 quarter three for one and a half million dollars. Yeah, I'll go here um, for MongoDB that was founded at a particular point in time. Now, how does graph know about all these time points? Well, if you go to official graph options and you go here to time bar, then here you, for example, can see um, sometimes you have a start time or an end time. I don't have a demo today with start time and end times, but you also have moment, momentary time predicates. And here we see five time predicates in our application that are of interest. And so <coughs> when was the particular found, uh, uh, funding round, uh, when got the company the first funding, um, when was the last funding, and 
is the acquisition date. Yes, so here's some predicates in the system that you have to have uh, manually. And if you go, to, and by the way, the demo that I'm giving today, you can do it yourself because we made this Crunchbase demo available on our Allegro Graph page. Um, and then there's also an instruction on how to use this and, and what predicates to add. Anyway, yes, so I added at some point these predicates. And now I can look at the history of MongoDB. Yeah? So I can go here. I drag this to the right. And at some point, I see that MongoDB was started, but it didn't have any investments yet. This was in, uh, when was this? This was in 2007. Yeah. I keep going 2008, and he had got the first venture, a small bunch, a small venture round of one and a half million dollars from Union Square Ventures, and it was going well. So Union Square Ventures invested again, but now together with Flybridge Capital. Yes, yeah, so and now there's two people that invested, and then at some point, Sequoia. Capital also thought that it might be an interesting opportunity, and they put in a six and a half million. And then there was yet another round. Oh, sorry, this was twenty. Sorry, this was twenty million. This was uh, 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 six and a half. And so we keep going all the way to the end till we have an investment. With uh, well, look at the red line. You can see all the partners that were interested in this, including Red Hat, Intel Capital, Salesforce, that all wanted to be in on this, and they invested together $150 million. Yeah? So this is one way, so you can see in the graph how this was built up. Yeah? Let's look at another one. Uh, let's see, Couchbase. Couchbase. And again, I can look at um, the interests, and I can select those, and I can look at those. And the interesting thing is that no one um, actually. Um, so, so all the investors here that invested in Couchbase did not invest in MongoDB. And everyone in MongoDB did not invest in Couchbase, which was kind of interesting, I thought. So people have a particular portfolio, and I guess they don't want to invest against themselves. So let's look at another database company. Let's look at Neo Technologies. Neo is Neo Technology. Again, we select investees, yeah, and then um, for fun, we also look at the ones that invest in them. Oh, yeah, and again, nothing. Now, of course, there will be links between them. I mean, it would be weird if there, were, there weren't any links. I mean, if you, for example, go to Inqtel, then there must be a relationship with Couchbase. I mean, sorry, the, most, this is, the investment community is so small, if you look at it as a graph. That if, oh, oh, sorry. I will actually have to select the right predicates for this. So I'm selecting acquiree and acquirer and invest, investee and investor. So now if I look for relationships, I probably will find a whole bunch of relationships. Yeah, But none of them are direct. Yeah, it's all indirect. Anyway, let's go back here. Let's do one, the time machine one more time. Um, so here, we go all the way back. Then we want to know, okay, so this was the big NoSQL movement. Yeah, so there's the, uh, the, all the NoSQL databases came up. So let's look again, who started first? And so we got, I think here, new technology. MongoDB started, um, first venture for MongoDB. Then uh, Neo got some investment from Sunstone, uh, Sunstone Capital. 
then finally Crunchbase came up, Mongo got some more investment, and I'll just get, keep going and going, and that's, it's not that interesting. <laughs> uh, but the point, one important thing I want to show you here is, so this looks at the buildup, but what you can also do is, for example, take a time window here, so you see this one here, um, and you can make it arbitrarily wide, and then you go with your mouse in the middle, and then you can only look at events that were active in a particular time period. So we go here, Neo, and the reason it's gone because we're looking at things that happen in a particular time window. So in this case, the time window is, uh, when I go here, it's gone again, and then we get Mongo, and that is gone. We get Dispenser, that goes again. So sometimes it's good to look at a particular graph just to see when things happen without the clutter of everything else around it. Yes? And so, I hope that is clear enough. Now, of course, <clears throat> this gets more powerful. This is really nice to do next to the regular database technology. So I could do a query here. Let's see. Um, bunch base. So this is a query that says <coughs> find all the people, find all the investment rounds and the, and the investors that invested in NEO, that invested in MongoDB and in Couchbase. And here you see <coughs> the results of the query, the Sparkle query. Now I hope you see what the graph adds to this. This is of course nice, I can click on time and I can see over time that Mongo started with the uh, funding and then NEO, NEO Technologies, Couchbase. Yeah, but you can see how over time this works. And sometimes this is a really nice overview, or you can look at all the companies that invested in Couchbase over time, or how much money was spent, or the investors. Um, but this is a nice uh, in addition to also having the graph view here. Yeah, let me just take the amount out. All right. So... Craig, are there any questions online about this? Otherwise, I want to take it to the next one. Okay. So this is um, one way to, to look at the time machine then. <clears throat> it's already being used by analysts. So let me show you another little demo here. Um, caps lock this on. So this is a completely different demo. This is done uh, in the context of a DARPA project where we looked at how uh, people, uh, this is for a, a police application where they wanted to investigate how when people are tracked you not can only look at the actual facts but you can also look at what we call probabilistic events like if two people that come from the same criminal cell that make a phone call, not to each other, but to other people, but they're within the range of 100 meters and, say, uh, one minute, well, then you kind of can assume that these two people probably also have met each other, yeah? So you create a probabilistic event of a, maybe a probability of just a 0 0.001, but at least now you have a probabilistic event in your database. So we worked on the database with phone calls, location events, observations, people driving in cars, license plates, etc., etc. So now you get this, you get a database where 20% of the data is real facts and 80% of the data are like in statistically inferred facts. Yeah. But then you still can do graph search over the entire thing. I'm not going too deep into this, but let me give you a, a quick example. So we have, uh, let's see here, uh, to the desktop. This is, of course, all made up data and a simulation. So don't worry, this is about real people. Yes, so here you see that there's a person, <clears throat> Pablo, and here all the way there is a person, Alberto and, Alberto. and the question is, how do we prove that there was some kind of relationship between them over time? Yeah, and we see that Pablo 
was in some probable meeting with a person that we don't know by name. And this person had some other probable meetings with these people here, which by themselves were linked to probable meetings. So they probably talked, and then ultimately they were linked through what we call an information transfer, which is some other types of communications that we have, to Ricardo, which is then linked to Alberto through an information in, in a transfer. And of course, there's also a much directer link with Pablo as a cell phone, where he made some calls to another cell phone, this Ricardo, and then we can go again to the info transfers to Alberto. Yeah, so this is a, a little graph, and then of course what the analysts really want to know is um, how does this happen over time? Now the time range here is pretty big, so let me let me just start at the beginning. So in the beginning we only know that Pablo has the cell phone, and that this person has a particular car, and this and, and the cell phone's here, and then we start going over time, and we find that the first thing happened is that these two people met each other on a particular date. And then there were some more, more probable meetings that connected them to other people. Yeah. And there were far more probable meetings that created a bigger network. And at some point, we could even add the calls and then other type of information events. Now, for you in the, in, in the, as an audience, doesn't mean that much to look at this picture. But it is a really important tool for analysts to look at how communications between people develop over time. And again, this is used in practice. OK, so having said that, um, there's some more features here at the bottom. Uh, oh, this is, this is not so good an, an example. Oh, let me go back to the previous meeting. I'm back in the previous database. So I forgot to mention one important screen um, on the desktop. So here's a picture of how Mongo, MongoDB again, and Couchbase, and Neo Technology, and all the investments around that connected all together. Here in the middle, we can also look at how this unfolds over time in a more like a graph view. You still can drag the time around. The colors are here are denoted by the, 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 the type of predicate that you have. And then you can sort it by going to earliest, or you take the, the mean, or you, or you take the latest, or you can even reverse the time. Uh, but the point is, sometimes it makes sense to actually look at it this way to see general trends in your data. And having that said that, I'm going back to my PowerPoint presentation. Um, so if you want to play with Crunchbase yourself, yeah, just go to our download page for uh, Graph, and you'll find the, the Crunchbase uh, data set. It's all the way at the bottom of the page. And then if you go to our documentation and you look for time bar, then you find this little page. Uh, we might even add the link to this page below it uh, on time today. Anyway, this is an explanation on how you can work with this feature yourself. Um, and that was it for today. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Question is, let's see what we got here. Um, first question is, will this work with other triple stores? Uh, yes. Yeah, you can go to Sparkle endpoints as long as they have um, well, the, the only thing that we need is that you tell a, a graph what the predicate is that has a particular time on it. And the second condition is that that predicate needs to be uh, a, 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 has the syntax of ISO, the, the ISO standard for databases. I forget the number right now. OK. OK. <clears throat> Let's see, next question is, uh, can Gref use images for the node? Uh, yes. Um, yes, we can. Actually, um, yeah, if you want to play with that. So another database that you can download from our website. Let me go back to the graph view. 
I see. Maybe maybe this even this will work. Red hat. Let me see. Control B. Oh, <laughs> yeah. For most, for almost anything that DBpedia knows about or the Wikipedia knows about, this picture. So if you just hit Control B on a on a on a link. Oh well. I actually was going to go into my healthcare database with the pictures look far more horrible than uh, than here. <laughs> anyway, I hope you get my point. Yeah. So you can use, but there's another way that you can use the pictures, and that is actually that you use instead of having the node, that the node would be replaced by this picture. Um, let me Let's go ahead and show it. Okay, so here, yeah, that is. Let me find a. An, a let me find this. Um, so one thing, this is came from a presentation recently that I did for FIBO, this, this big um, um, initiative by banks in the United States, well actually in internationally, where they built this ontology uh, for banks. And in that meeting, the, the guy that leads it is called Dennis Winsnowski. So I, I looked him up on, on the, on the uh, DBpedia. I look at the top of my slide here, live.dbpedia.org, that's Sparkle. Yeah. And so I looked him up, and I made sure that in the label attributes, I tell that I want to use the label, the, the picture property as the, 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 the node label. So now instead of getting a text, I get a picture for that node. So here I got this. It even works to the point where I can put it into our graphical query view, so where I took some of the nodes and turned them into variables. And then when I do the query, I see how uh, this person, Dennis Wisnowski, is linked to various other um, uh, 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 football players in the, in the world. Anyway, this is, this is just a demo of how you can use pictures for nodes. OK. You showed graph with made up data. What is your preferred method of entering triples, for example, use cases, graph, allegograph, web, or other method? Um, well, usually uh, what you can do is, but what some people do is you, you put the triples in an Excel spreadsheet, so just subject, predicate, object, and then you save it as a comma separated file. And you write a little, well, program to um, turn the the data into triples. And I can show. On, yeah. Well. Anyway, uh, send me an email for how how we do that. Okay. This is, and by uh, the way, Graph does allow you to enter triples, uh, but I find the other way uh, uh, faster. Does this work for property graph databases? Um. No, we are thinking of an interface. Um, I, I know, I mean, it would be fairly simple to do, uh, but currently it doesn't work. OK, one more question here. Could you say something about triple attributes? <sighs> OK, uh, OK, well, um, yeah, so that is the newest feature that we're talking about in the press and I guess that's why I came up. Um, so we we have a new method um, to protect our triples. Uh, it's the most fine-grained control for graph databases right now uh, on the market uh, where you actually can add um, a JSON object to any triple in your database and the JSON object has uh, key value pairs, so you can have arbitrary key value pairs for every triple. And then when you do queries, you also add uh, key value pairs to your Sparkle query. Let's see if I have some. You can, uh, you can have, um, you can add key value pairs to your user, and then you can define rules. So for example, I have a little example here. For example, we have person one has diagnostic, diagnostic one, and diagnostic one is prep label bipolar. What we added to this triple is a JSON object that says that the medical record number for this triple is this. If you want to see this 
triple, you have a security level eight or higher. And if you want to see the triples, you have to be from the pediatrics or cancer research. By the way, I'm talking about them in the context of security, but you can, you can also, you can just use this for anything. You don't have to use it for security in itself. It just turns a Lego graph into a property graph database in some sense. Yeah. And then I can set security filters. Yeah. This, this rule says, well, if the user security level is higher than a triple security level, I can see the triples. Or if the user department contains some of the triple department, then you can see the triple. And so when you do a, what the application uh, server will do that sits between the user and uh, Allegro Graph, it will add, probably by using LDAP, some user attributes to the Sparkle query. So here you see user attributes. And we say this particular user has a security level two, and this user is from the administrative department. Well, this guy then has no chance in, in hell to see any of these triples here uh, when he wants to do this query, because his security level is not high enough, and he's from the wrong department, if that makes any sense. Anyway, this project, this is now beginning to get used by several of our customers, um, and I would really recommend to try it out for yourself. Okay, we'll take maybe one more and then wrap it up. How can you provide a date range as input if you'd like to query the data using Sparkle? Uh, well, well in, in Sparkle, you just use the regular uh, 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 date elements. Uh, so, so we have a lot of patterns where an event not only has, say, a creation time, but also a start time and an end time. And uh, and and then you can do your regular Sparkle queries. I actually do not really understand what the query means in this case. How can you provide the date range input if you'd like to query the data using Sparkle? You just use the filter mechanisms in Sparkle for this. Okay, that's it.